Welcome to our course on Subcontractor Scopes of Work. My name is Jason Smith and I'm very happy to lead this presentation. Now we've all noticed throughout our careers that many common scope busts and double coverages occur repeatedly from project to project. This is something that's bugged me ever since I was a young project engineer and started handling my very first change order issues. I think we all know there's not much a vice president or president of a company dislikes more than seeing money going out the door for mistakes that could have and should have been prevented. This course addresses how to prevent mistakes in writing bid instructions and subscope attachments. Now, this course consists of a series of examples. I've always found examples to be much more interesting and informative than long, drawn-out theoretical discussions. Also, what we're talking about here are change order issues. And change order issues are eclectic, they're not systematic. I mention this because our discussion will be organized by trade, but during each trade discussion I'll be providing a myriad of diverse issues associated with each respective sub. The presentation is clear and organized, but we'll be jumping from one issue to the next fairly quickly. This is the first session of a three-part series, and in this first session we'll address the following trades. Mass excavation, which consists of the demolition, earthwork, shoring, dewatering, and even groundwater decontamination of contractors. Structural concrete. In addition to the formwork, rebar, shotcrete, and place and finish trades, we'll also address the below-grade waterproofing in this segment and site work, which will include the underground utilities, landscaping, AC paving, and site concrete trades. There are many goals to this course, but a few of the more important goals include the following. Gaining a solid applied knowledge of the intricacies of each subcontractor's scope of work, particularly how to avoid scope gaps and double coverages. You'll learn the intricacies of writing comprehensive bid instructions for each of the individual building trades. Attaining a good working knowledge of the structural concrete, mass excavation, and site work trades with a primary focus on how the work of a project is delineated among the myriad of subcontractors. You will also become much more knowledgeable in your role as a leader of the subcontractors. Let's begin our training by talking about the shoring trade. Many cities and private owners require detensioning tiebacks. This is primarily because tension cables pose a safety hazard if they're hit when trenching in the future. Tiebacks are temporary structures and they're usually provided by a design-build shoring subcontractor, so they won't be on the drawings. But, the shoring subcontractor is not the only guy involved here, so an obvious problem is that the work needed by other trades won't be on the drawings either. When something isn't on the drawings, the bidders won't include it unless specifically directed to, and this is where the bid instructions come in. Bidders do what they can to keep their bids as low as possible, so they absolutely will not include anything that they don't have to, or anything they don't think their competitors are providing. So let's talk about the work involved here. Blockouts in the foundation wall are required for access to the heads so that they can be detentioned once construction is far enough along for the building to support itself. The formwork subcontractor will construct the blockouts. The detentioning and cutting off of the ends will be by the shoring subcontractor. Tiebacks and their blockouts interrupt the wall steel, so we need to compensate for this by adding additional rebar trim steel around the top, bottom, and sides of the openings, and that's naturally provided by the rebar sub. After the tiebacks are detentioned and the ends cut off, the waterproofing subcontractor will come back to place a rubber boot, shaped something like a top hat, over the head, and then patch the membrane to it. Responsibility for infilling the blockouts depends on the wall construction type. It could be by the shotcrete subcontractor if it's a shotcrete wall, or it could be by the formwork and place and finish subcontractors if the foundation wall is cast in place concrete. And keep in mind, when these guys come back to infill the blockouts, the building construction will have progressed quite a ways along, and you may even have finishes in place. So, make sure each sub is responsible for protection of the path of travel between the building entrance and their work at each individual blockout. This is especially important for the shotcrete hoses. Dragging those things through the building is not an easy task. I have a couple other things worth noting here. The elevation of the tiebacks is also very important information to distribute to the bidders. If a blockout is at working height, we won't need a scaffold for the detentioning, form stripping, and infilling work. These elevations need to be confirmed by the design build shoring bidders, and other trades need to be informed as to whether or not they will need to provide scaffolds to access their work. Also, in addition to ensuring the concrete and waterproofing trades include these blockouts, make sure they know the quantity. Most importantly, the number of rows. 
Shoring bidders may have two rows of tiebacks, while the concrete and waterproofing subs assume only a single row. This bust happens when bidders are only told to include tieback blockouts and not given any more specific direction. Shoring engineers typically have tunnel vision on their work. They're not concerned with other trades, only with designing the shoring in the most economical manner possible, and as a result, they can cause serious financial impacts to the other trades. The impacts are considered to be trade coordination issues for which the general contractor is financially responsible. So let's go over a few examples of scope busts that are commonly associated with the shoring trade. Rakers and corner bracing can present a major impact to other trades. The use of these components makes shoring bids less because these inboard supports are cheaper than using tiebacks, but it adds cost to the concrete trades and the waterproofing subcontractor. If the shoring bidders are not told that this is prohibited, and concrete and waterproofing trades are not told that these components are going to be in their way, we're going to have a scope bust, and it's a big one. We'll either be paying the shoring subcontractor to go and use tiebacks in lieu of these inboard braces, or we'll be compensating the concrete and waterproofing trades for inefficiencies and additional work. Supplemental tiebacks are inevitable and we need to plan for them. These are necessary when we hit weak soil and don't pass the tieback pull testing. Soils reports are based on borings, which by nature is just a random sampling of subgrade conditions, so hitting looser than expected soil from time to time is really just a fact of life. Supplemental tiebacks are very common, they're used on just about every project, and although their quantity is a variable, shoring bidders actually do include these in their base bids. However, the concrete and waterproofing trades do not include these in their base bids, so don't forget to address the blockouts for supplemental tiebacks. This is a variable, but my recommendation is to estimate an additional quantity and have the bidders include that quantity. Then also get a unit cost from the bidders to eventually adjust for the final quantity. Tieback pilaster conflicts need to be avoided, and that might necessitate additional soldier piles. Pilasters are routinely very highly congested with rebar, so much so that tieback heads and waterproofing boots just simply won't fit. This means the soldier piles need to be shifted to avoid the pilasters. This shifting will affect the soldier pile spacing, and it may require that additional soldier piles be added due to the inefficient spacing. This needs to be included in the shoring bid instructions, otherwise you're going to wind up with a change order issue. Similarly, we need to be sure that the tieback heads don't align with the floor decks or the parking ramp. The shoring system needs to be designed to account for the loads related to trucks, cranes, and other heavy equipment. Shoring systems are traditionally designed to withstand fixed loads only, such as soil and adjacent buildings, not for live loads like trucks, dewatering settlement tanks, office trailers, that excavator reaching down for the last little bit of dirt, and especially cranes. So we usually need to upsize the shoring system along the trucking lane and where heavy equipment is going to be placed. You'll likely need trench plates and crane mats too. These are used to disperse the point loads from truck tires, crane outriggers, and other items, and the rental for these seemingly plain items can actually be very expensive. When shoring engineers do in fact account for the live loads, they still routinely require that the point loads be dispersed with these items. So, we need the trench plates and crane mats either included in the bid instructions to the subcontractors, or as part of the general contractor's estimate for self-performed work. Just make sure they're covered. Trimming behind the face of pile should always be allocated to the shoring subcontractor. And be careful, because they very often try to exclude this work in their bids. The mass excavation subcontractor will excavate to a relatively straight line along the face of piles, but lagging boards are tucked behind the front flange of the piles, and the shoring subcontractor needs to hand trim for the lagging board installation. They typically do this with handheld pneumatic equipment. All subcontractors, including the shoring sub, need to include procuring and paying for their own permits. Don't just tell the subs to include the cost of the permit, as often happens. They need to include all interactions with the city. If the general contractor doesn't allocate this work to the subs, they're going to spend a tremendous amount of time waiting in line down at the city for each and every deferred permit on the project. Make sure the subs do this for their own permits. The general contractor's time is much better spent managing the project than going and pulling permits for all the various subs. Once the building construction has reached a point that the shoring is no longer necessary, we always need to cut the piles down below the hardscape and or landscaping that abuts the building. The depth of these cuts usually ranges from about 2 to 5 feet. 
Cutting off the tops of the piles requires the work of multiple subs, none of which will be clearly identifiable on the drawings. The excavation, backfill, and compaction work will be completed by the excavation subcontractor, not the shoring sub. And keep in mind that they need to be very careful when digging next to the blow-grade waterproofing membrane to avoid damaging it, and that means that quite a bit of hand digging needs to be included in their bids, as opposed to doing the whole thing with a backhoe. Cutting and disposal of the pile tops will be by the shoring subcontractor. Don't forget the off-haul and disposal. That's very oftentimes found as an exclusion in the shoring bids. We don't want the shoring sub leaving behind a big mound of pile scraps that we've got to hoist onto trucks and get rid of. The tops of piles are cut off with a torch, and that torch inevitably damages the waterproofing membrane. Patching of the membrane is going to be by the waterproofing sub. Now this is largely unavoidable, but there are a couple methods we can use to minimize the damage. Before installing the waterproofing membrane, we can place a cement board barrier between the face of pile and the membrane where the cut is going to later occur. When allowed by the shoring engineer of record, we can pre-cut the face of pile to a few inches behind the membrane during the excavation phase. This way, when we come back to cut off the tops of piles, the torch will start a few inches away from the membrane rather than right on top of it. I, of course, recommend taking both of these precautions, not just one or the other. Now, neither of these precautionary measures will be covered by the bidders unless specifically directed to, and this is a significant cost issue for the waterproofing sub. This is a big quality control issue because damage sandwiched between the remaining pile and the building wall is very difficult to patch. When proper care isn't taken, this patching will be very extensive and very costly. And once again, if the subs are not directed to include this work in the bid instructions, this work is going to get paid out of the contingency, and we've got to protect that contingency. Okay, now we'll move into a discussion on the mass excavation trade. With mass excavation, there are comparatively fewer change order requests, but these change order requests are regularly very expensive. The most common and most preventable change order issues with regard to this trade are where we're dealing with additional spoils. Let's go through some common sources of additional spoils for which the offhaul is frequently done by the excavation subcontractor. These examples I'm about to go over are also commonly missed in the bid instructions, and when they are, the offhaul is paid for from the general contractor's contingency. Tapping into contingency is always a painful experience, especially for issues like these that are highly preventable. Tieback drilling spoils. We need to coordinate the length, diameter, and quantity of tiebacks between the shoring and excavation bidders during the bidding phase. Soldier pile drilling spoils. Soldier piles are commonly installed in one of three methods, driven, vibrated, or drilled. If the piles are driven or vibrated, there are no additional spoils. But if they're set in drilled holes, there are additional spoils. We need to coordinate the shoring methods with the excavation bidders during the bidding period. The excavation bidders are going to need to know the depth, diameter, and quantity of these drilled holes. Dewatering well drilling spoils. Dewatering is traditionally a design-build trade, so these won't be on the drawings. Nevertheless, the excavation bidders need to know the depth, diameter, and quantity during the bidding period. Hydraulic elevator ram drilling spoils. Now these may be on the architectural and or vertical transportation drawings, but unless the excavation bidders are specifically told otherwise, those guys are going to assume that the elevator subcontractor is off-hauling his own spoils. On fast-track projects, the pits and depressions aren't always shown on preliminary drawings, especially the plumbing pits. Fast-track projects commonly bid the mass excavation trades off very preliminary drawings, so we've got to anticipate those pits and convey their size and locations to the excavation bidders. Mud slabs are used to provide a solid and clean working surface at the base of an excavation, and they're usually about two inches thick. These are a means and methods of construction, so they won't be on the drawings. Protection slabs are used to provide stable working surfaces over the top of a waterproofing membrane, and of course to protect the membrane. They're typically about four inches thick, and once again, it's a means and methods of construction, so these things won't be on the drawings. Notably, the thickness of the waterproofing membrane, which is typically about a half an inch, will not be addressed by the civil engineer in preparation of his drawings. And remember, the excavation bidders are looking at the civil drawings when they're preparing their estimates. So that waterproofing membrane is another half inch of depth that they need to account for. These slabs are only a few inches thick, so it wouldn't seem like much. But let's take a look at this calculation. For this example, consider a 200 foot wide by 300 foot long mat foundation, and we've got a 2 inch mud slab, a half inch waterproofing system, 
and a 4 inch protection slab for a total of 6.5 inches. 200 feet by 300 feet by 6.5 inches is 32,500 cubic feet of soil. That equals over 1,200 cubic yards of additional excavation. When the general contractor forgets to address this in the bid instructions, they end up being on the hook for one heck of a big change order request from the excavation subcontractor. Additional spoils are a common and costly problem, so let's go ahead and run through a couple more examples here before we get moving on. Usually about one inch is required for the waterproofing system at the vertical walls. This is a little thicker than the horizontal applications because in vertical applications we always have a drainage mat. Horizontal applications don't need the drainage mat. Timber lagging is a staple in the shoring industry. So, unless directed otherwise, the excavation bidders are going to naturally assume that timber lagging is being used. If the shoring subcontractor plans to use shotcrete lagging, this needs to be conveyed to the excavation bidders. For one, the shotcrete lagging might be 5 or even 6 inches thick, as opposed to the standard 4x materials that we use for timber lagging. Secondly, as you'll see from this illustration, the shotcrete lagging actually goes on the face of pile. It's not tucked behind the pile like timber lagging is. So in the case of shotcrete lagging, the excavation subcontractor is actually going to do all excavation for the lagging. And finally, underpinning pits. These pits can generate a lot of additional spoils. Next we'll look at the incidental work associated with the trucking operation. Excavation bidders often try to exclude much, if not all, of the incidental and indirect work associated with their scope. Subcontractors often exclude flagmen, assuming that the general contractor is going to perform that work for them, but that's rarely the case. Be sure the excavation and all other subcontractors include their own flagmen. Those excavators make a mess, and not all the dirt makes it right into the bed of the truck. That loose dirt on the rim of the truck beds, wheel wells, and everywhere else needs to be swept off the trucks before they leave the site, otherwise they're going to leave a dirt trail down the city streets. Unfortunately, Excavation subs often exclude incidental yet very important and very necessary work like this. And when the general contractor misses this in the bidding, they end up doing it with their own laborers. Pressure washing the truck tires should also be performed by the excavation sub. This is similar to sweeping the rims of the truck beds and the wheel wells. In muddy or sticky clay conditions, brooms just aren't enough and we need pressure washers. Excavation bidders will always include street sweepers as a regular practice. But to be honest, those things often do a lot more to spread the dirt than to pick it up. As a result, vacuum trucks are often deemed necessary, and sometimes they're even mandated by a city directive. The fact is, excavation is a messy activity, and the streets get dirty from all those trucks rolling out, no matter how well we sweep them off. Pressure washing is often necessary to bring the streets back to the condition they were in prior to construction, and the extent of this pressure washing is generally about 40 to 80 feet beyond the project site, depending on the specific project conditions. So, as you can see here, if the general contractor isn't careful, he's going to wind up doing a whole lot of unplanned and highly preventable labor that should have been allocated to the subcontractors. This can be a huge hit to the project contingency. Let's discuss demolition. We'll start with the slab on grade and what lies beneath it. Now, the scope of work between the demolition and excavation subcontractors is usually best delineated with man made versus natural products. For instance, the demolition subcontractor should demolish and off-haul the slab on grade and the vapor barrier and get rid of it right along with the rest of their debris. Then the dirt-like products like sand and aggregate base should be off-hauled by the earthwork subcontractor right along with the rest of their soil. There is one big exception to this man-made versus natural rule of thumb and that's that the conduit and piping below grade should also be taken care of by the excavation subcontractor. Unlike the vapor barrier and slab on grade, these man-made objects are most efficiently unearthed and disposed of by the excavation sub simply because it's too inefficient for the demolition subcontractor to try and dig them up. Now, the excavation subcontractor will typically rip these things out of the ground, but be careful with their bids because they may exclude off-hauling of these items. And if they do, you're going to wind up with a great big pile of pipe, conduit, catch basins, etc. over in the corner of your site. And you don't want to use your contingency to off-haul these things. The demolition subcontractor is not typically the best party to perform layout. Demolition subs have a lot of great attributes and a lot of guys who work really hard. The problem is, quality control and attention to detail are not some of the better attributes of a demo sub. When a demo sub is told to go and demolish, let's say, 50 walls for a TI project, they're going to demolish those walls and then some. 
they're going to leave jagged chipboard edges. And what's going to happen is the framing subcontractor is going to come in to do their work, and they're going to have to clean up, trim, patch all of the chipboard that the demolition sub has ripped apart. And this will be considered extra work for the framing sub. Be sure the delineation of work between the demolition and hazardous materials abatement subcontractors is clearly defined. These guys are both effectively demolition subs, so they need a very clear division of work between them. Complicating this further is that the owner usually hires the environmental sub due to liability concerns, but the general contractor traditionally hires the demo sub. Let's go through just a couple examples of how these guys work together. Acoustical ceiling tiles that just glue on to the underside of a structural deck were really popular back 30 and 40 years ago, so let's look at that as our first example. What if the acoustical ceiling tiles are clean, but the mastic is an ACM? ACM stands for Asbestos Containing Material. The environmental subcontractor isn't going to want to scrape the mastic off the back of each and every acoustical tile, so what they're going to do is they're just going to take the whole tile with them. Even though the tiles themselves are not asbestos containing, the environmental subcontractor will handle them. What if the pipe insulation is hot? Hot is another slang term for asbestos containing material. If the pipe insulation has asbestos in it, the environmental subcontractor isn't going to try and scrape that insulation off all the piping. They're just going to take the piping right along with the insulation. There are several scenarios for gypsum board walls. For instance, if the gypsum board is clean, but the taping mud has asbestos in it, the environmental subcontractor is just going to take the gypsum board with the taping mud. They're not going to try and scrape all that taping mud off the gyp board. However, let's say the gypsum board and taping mud are both clean, but the wall insulation is hot. In this case, the environmental subcontractor will cut out the gypsum board in order to access the insulation, and they'll take the insulation with them. The gypsum board they'll leave stacked on the floor for the demolition sub to eventually offhaul. Now these are just a few random examples. But hopefully these examples help you get a good understanding of the level of detail we need to get into in order to effectively delineate the work of these two trades. Quality control during demolition is a very significant concern, especially when the building will be partially occupied during construction. Improving quality has a very real cost, so we do need to address it in the bid instructions. Negative air containment is especially crucial for partially occupied buildings. This is a continuously running exhaust fan that pumps air out of the construction area, and this keeps dust from migrating into the occupied area. These fans won't be included by the demo bidders unless they're specifically directed to include them in the bid instructions. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, the ends of gypsum board walls need to be cut cleanly. For TI projects in particular, where we have piping and conduit that's going to remain, the pipe and conduit needs to be cut at the line of demolition first, never just yanked down. When the demolition sub comes in and just starts yanking down pipe and conduit, what they do is they jerk around the existing portions to remain also, and we wind up with damaged joints and damaged supports. Repair of these damaged joints and supports is going to be extra work to the MEP subs when they come in to do their work. Always remember that demo guys are taught to smash things, not to protect them. We've got to remain cognizant of that mindset when we're managing them. When saw cutting or core drilling, the concrete slurry needs to be controlled and immediately cleaned up. Concrete cutting equipment is water cooled. That water mixes with the concrete dust and creates a slurry that runs everywhere. If that slurry isn't cleaned up right away, it's going to dry and it's going to stain. Overcuts when saw cutting concrete should never be allowed. Due to the curvature of a saw blade, the saw can't cut all the way to the bottom corners of a square opening. Those corners need to be chipped and ground smooth. Now that's a lot more work, so we need to be sure that the demo subs have it included in their bids. Dewatering is a very specialized trade. Let's go through a few common scope busts that are associated with these guys. Backup generators should always be provided by the dewatering subcontractor. If we lose power to the dewatering pumps, groundwater could rise up into the excavation and cause a heck of a lot more than just a mess. Shoring is designed for dry conditions, and wet soil weighs a lot more than dry so wet soil can overload the shoring system and cause the shoring system to fail. This is why we always provide generators as a standard practice. Although dewatering subs often either exclude the generators or list them as an ad alternate, so keep an eye out for this in their bids. Now, emergency generators need to be exercised about once a week, and that burns fuel. So the refueling is actually usually done by the general contractor, just simply because the dewatering sub isn't on site every day and it's really inefficient for them to try and manage refueling the generators once a week. Be sure this refueling is covered, not only in the budget, but also on site. 
If you've got the generator scheduled to be exercised on, let's say, Wednesday mornings at 8 to 9 a.m., be sure you've got a fuel truck scheduled to come in and top them off later that morning. Spot dewatering generally consists of a couple laborers walking around the site with a pump and a discharge hose, just getting the ponding water out of the excavation. This is most efficiently completed by the general contractor. Dewatering subcontractors aren't on site every day, nor do they have the manpower for this, so it's best for the general contractor to cover this in their estimate. Miscellaneous pipe repairs should be completed by the general contractor. Dewatering systems are cheap, flimsy, made of PVC, and pretty easily breakable, but for good reason. There's no reason to spend more money than necessary on these temporary systems. But this PVC is going to break, and when it does, it needs to be fixed quickly. PVC is really easy to patch, so there's no reason to spend $500 or $1,000 to have a dewatering subcontractor send a guy out to fix it. The general contractor should just keep a stock of materials on site and have their laborers fix the breaks as they occur. The dewatering pipe crossing the trucking ramp will need to be buried. The piping across the truck ramp is usually the only buried dewatering pipe on a project. Most of the dewatering pipes are typically installed on the guardrail posts around the excavation, which is a very efficient mounting method, helps provide good drainage for the pipes, and it also keeps them off the ground and out of the way. Because the dewatering subcontractors don't usually have backhoes on site, the excavation subs will usually trench, set the sleeve, backfill, and compact the soil for this buried pipe across the truck ramp. Now the excavation subs don't usually mind doing this work, they just need to be directed to in the bid instructions, and it needs to be itemized in their subcontract agreement. However, excavation subcontractors don't usually have a bunch of steel pipe laying around the site, so we want to have the dewatering sub furnish their own steel sleeve. Now, this may sound like a small item, and it is, but the problem is, if we don't tell them to provide the steel sleeve, they won't. And when it comes time to run that pipe across the trucking ramp, the dewatering sub's going to be standing there and saying, hey, where's my sleeve? And somebody's going to have to spend a couple hours of their day in a fire drill running down to the hardware store to pick up a piece of pipe. Slotted well casings are required when the wells are too close to the excavation, which is very common on inner city projects. Naturally, the slots are so that the groundwater can run freely through the casing. With uncased wells, we run the risk of cave-in. Depending on how far back the wells are from the site of the excavation, a cave-in may not occur until the excavation reaches 40 or 50 feet. And that's a big cave-in. That's a lot of drain rock from these wells that's just going to dump and run into the excavation. Now, dewatering subcontractors will not provide these casings unless they're specifically directed to. This is a very common exclusion from dewatering subs. And when this is overlooked, it's a sizable change order request, and it's a huge hit to the general contractor's contingency. Let's walk step by step through cutting, capping, and abandoning the dewatering wells. This is very similar to cutting off the tops of the shoring piles that we discussed earlier. The dewatering subcontractor will remove their pump and discharge pipe, which naturally causes the drain rock to settle down lower in the casing. This salvaging of materials may be the only piece of this operation that's included in the sub bids without specific direction otherwise in the bid instructions. The excavation subcontractor should dig down to provide safe access to the point of cut on the casing. The dewatering subcontractor will cut off the well casing typically about 5 feet below grade, and they also need to be responsible for off-hauling the debris. Backfilling from the top of drain rock to the top of casing will be completed by the dewatering subcontractor. This is usually done with slurry concrete, but it's also sometimes done with pea gravel or other self-compacting material. And finally, importing the soil, backfilling, and compacting the soil is typically done by the excavation subcontractor. Contaminated sites require that the groundwater be treated on site to the point the pollutants are dropped to acceptable levels for discharge to the city system. Now, although this system simply plugs in between the end of the dewatering system and the start of the city sewer, it's by no means simple. So let's go over some common scope buzz associated with the decon work. Depending on the type and quantity of contaminants, as well as the local codes and ordinances, the dewatering system is going to discharge to either the sanitary sewer or storm drain systems. The tie-in to the city main is usually completed by the site utility subcontractor. Now, this is just one of many good reasons to get the site utilities done early in a project. It's a lot cheaper and a lot easier to just go ahead and tie into that permanent line than it is to go through the time and expense of installing a temporary line. With contaminated groundwater, we need to periodically test the water both upstream and downstream of the decon system throughout the project. This means the dewatering sub needs to include testing ports in their piping. Now, the testing is usually required to be done at each well, 
not just at the end once the piping is accumulated. This means the dewatering subcontractor needs to include testing ports at each individual well. We do this so that we can tell which wells are pumping the dirtiest versus the cleanest water. These are often forgotten about until the decon sub shows up on site and says, hey, where are the testing ports at? And that's when we end up cutting them into the dewatering system. And when we do it at this point, we're going to be signing a field tag for the dewatering sub and taking a hit to the contingency to put these testing ports in. Carbon filter replacements are very costly. But because the frequency of these filter changes is a variable, it isn't fair for the subcontractors to be held responsible for this variable cost within their lump sum bid. Ideally, this should be reimbursed by the owner based upon a unit cost received with the decontamination subcontractor's bid. Until we start pumping water through the decon system, there's really no way to tell if those filters are going to need to be changed every two days or maybe every week, and that's a big difference in cost. So, for this reason, it's best handled by an owner-held budget. Let's walk through the dewatering system and talk about who provides what. The dewatering subcontractor will naturally provide the wells, the pumps, and the discharge piping. The dewatering subcontractor also needs to be held responsible for the settlement tank. Now this is often excluded in their bids, so watch out for it. The settlement tank is used to separate out the silts from the water before the water is discharged to the city system. The piping from the downstream end of the settlement tank to the upstream end of the decontamination system should also be by the dewatering subcontractor. The decon system naturally is by the decon sub, and the piping from the downstream end of the decon system to the site utilities point of connection is also by the decon sub. Then, as mentioned before, the site utilities are by the site utility subcontractor. With contaminated groundwater, we usually need to dump it into the sanitary sewer system as opposed to the storm drain system. This is because the sanitary sewer system is treated at the end of the line before the water is discharged back into the environment. When we go into the sanitary sewer system, we generally need a discharge permit and discharge fees, and those fees are based on the quantity of water that we're dumping into the sanitary sewer system. The discharge permit is usually procured and paid for by the general contractor. The meters are usually provided free of charge from the city, and then they're installed by the site utility subcontractor. Discharge fees can be very expensive. And the reality is that we don't know how much water we're going to be dumping into the city main until we actually have the dewatering system up and running and functional. So, at bidding time, this cost is a variable. Because this cost is a variable, it's most appropriately covered by the owner directly. Okay, now let's move into the concrete trades. We'll start with the formwork sub. These guys drive the schedule from the moment they step on site to the moment they step off site. Now before we move into the examples, let me point out that general contractors these days are commonly bidding formwork, rebar, place and finish, and shotcrete, all as a single combined package. But for the purpose of this course, we're going to assume each one of these trades is individually subcontracted by the contractor. Okay, let's go to our first example. Rebar templates are actually furnished by the formwork subcontractor, not by the rebar sub as the name may imply. A rebar template is really just a 2 by strapped to the top of the rebar, and it's used to position the wall dowels. The way this works is that the formwork subcontractor will lay out the position of the rebar template and they'll tie it off to the top of the rebar mat. The rebar sub will then come and set their dowels and tie them off to the rebar template. Then, during the finishing activities, the place and finish subcontractor will actually strip the rebar template. Once the concrete is consolidated and begins to set around the wall dowels, the place and finish subcontractor strips the rebar template and finishes the slab where the rebar template was. Anchor bolt templates should be steel, not wood, and furnished by the subcontractor whose work they are for. The formwork subcontractor will then set the templates and anchor bolts. Now naturally, anchor bolts are usually for either the structural steel or miscellaneous metal subcontractors who are very capable of making steel templates. Steel templates are much more accurate and much more durable than their wood counterpart, and they've become a very common practice in the industry. And notably, Although steel templates are very durable, they should still only be used once. They get banged up during the concrete pour and they get bent up when they're stripped, so we should not try to reuse steel templates. If not directed otherwise in the bid instructions, the steel subcontractor is going to assume that the formwork sub is making the templates out of wood, and conversely, the formwork bidders are going to think that the steel sub is going to provide these things. So we wind up with a scope gap. Be sure to pick these up in the bid instructions. The formwork subcontractor traditionally sets the concrete embeds, 
but the imp beds are actually furnished by the myriad of subcontractors who they're for. Now, structural steel and miscellaneous metals are two obvious examples, but imp beds can also come in the form of recessed entrance mats, recessed door closers, elevator sill angles, stair nosings, and the list can just go on and on and on. Now, this is pretty straightforward for most subs in divisions 1 through 14, but when you get to the MEP subs, it gets a little bit more complicated. Interestingly, MEP subs traditionally set their own sleeves, embedded conduit, junction boxes, embeds for their hangers, and other items of that nature. But when they need a blockout as opposed to an embed, the formwork sub will actually construct the blockout for them. For example, a 4 inch duct might have a 5 inch sleeve set in the concrete, and that sheet metal sleeve is actually furnished and installed by the mechanical sub. But for a larger duct, let's say a rectangular duct that's 12 inches square, that will actually have a blockout as opposed to a sleeve, and the blockout will be constructed by the formwork subcontractor. This might sound confusing to someone new to the industry, but it's so standardized throughout the industry at this point that it's actually second nature to an experienced PM. Although non-productive, pour watch personnel are critical to the success of a large concrete pour such as a mat slab. And this is really an insurance policy. We need someone from the rebar sub and someone from the formwork sub to be on standby in case something breaks during the pour, and things often break. These guys need to be available for emergency. You can't call timeout during a concrete pour. So these pour watch personnel need to not have any other duties during the pour. Now clearly, this is non-productive work, so bidders are not going to include pour watch personnel in their base bids unless specifically directed to in the bid instructions. Seepage control under a form deck should be completed by the formwork subcontractor. Seepage through the joints in the wood forms just happens. It's inevitable. But during a pour, it's easy to just hose the seepage down, dilute it, it turns to dust, it's no big deal. But after a pour, once the seepage is hardened, we have to chip it up, and that is not only more costly, but it also damages the concrete finish below. The formwork subcontractor is responsible for the integrity of their forms, so they also need to be responsible for cleaning up the seepage. Unfortunately, formwork bidders regularly exclude this in expectation of the general contractor doing it with their own laborers. The general contractor should not do this. We shouldn't give subs labor for free. Heck, they don't give us labor for free. Safety rails should be constructed by the formwork subcontractor, but the maintenance and eventual removal is most efficiently completed by the general contractor. Safety rails are not necessarily a form system component, but it's still most appropriate for the formwork sub to do them because the formwork sub will construct the safety rails as they progress along with their work on a daily and even hourly basis. The formwork sub will construct the rails, but because these rails are going to be necessary for long after the formwork sub has completed their work, it's most appropriate for the general contractor to pick up maintenance and eventual removal of the rails. It's a common construction practice for the metal stair pans to be temporarily infilled with wood. This is so that we don't pour the concrete too early in construction and then have the concrete finish on the stair treads damaged throughout the construction process. Now, like safety rails, the general contractor might do this themselves, but formwork bidders are equally qualified and routinely allocated this work. The most important thing, as always, just be sure that this is covered, but not double covered. And now we'll tackle the rebar trade. The quantities, sizes, and locations of rebar trim bars for large and small blockouts needs to be coordinated with the MEP and concrete trades. This is a common source of contention between general contractors and design teams. Generally, design teams are good at getting the major penetrations on the drawings, such as 8 square feet or larger, but not the smaller ones. Design teams will provide standard details for penetrations through the concrete walls and decks and then expect the general contractor to figure out where those details need to be applied during their MEP coordination process. The problem is, MEP coordination doesn't occur until well after bidding is complete. From the general contractor's side, they believe that this is part of the design team's document coordination process and as such, these penetrations should be shown on the drawings. Interestingly, there's really no set standard in the industry as to who wins this debate. But all in all, the only way to truly win an argument is to prevent the argument from occurring in the first place. One way to do that is for the general contractor to hold the rebar and other concrete trades responsible for reviewing the MEP drawings and include all penetrations that are reasonably inferred from those drawings. I'll say it again, the only way to truly win an argument is to prevent the argument from occurring in the first place, and this approach will help do that. Temporary concrete structures such as tower crane foundations and shot crete test panels will require rebar, 
but temporary structures will not be shown on the drawings. Additional rebar necessary for the means and methods of construction will not be on the drawings either, such as trim bars for the tieback blockouts. This work needs to be described in the bid instructions. Welding of rebar in the field is a common and costly scope gap. This gets missed a lot. Rebar welding requires a special certification, and in reality, not that many welders have this cert. Field welding of rebar is common enough for me to include in this course, but it is rare enough that rebar subcontractors don't keep union welders on staff. They routinely exclude welding rebar. Structural steel subcontractors exclude this as well because the rebar is not part of the structural steel system, and likewise, miscellaneous metal subs exclude it because they don't do rebar. In the end, we've got to convince one of these three subs to do it. Our first choice is always the rebar subcontractor. We try to get them to pick up their own welding. Our second choice is usually the structural steel sub, and if we can't convince the structural steel sub to do it, we go to the miscellaneous metal sub. But at the end of the day, we need to convince one of these three guys to do it, and it may involve one of these subcontractors calling the union hall and finding a welder with this certification that they can hire. Welded wire fabric of the stair pans is completed by the rebar subcontractor, not the miscellaneous metal subcontractors as often misunderstood. We can't tack that welded wire fabric into place in the shop, because when the stairs show up on site, we want to lay two bys in the pans for construction use, and that welded wire fabric would be in the way of those two bys. Now the welded wire fabric is a rebar product, but it might only be found in the metal stairs specification. It's not always on the stair details. The miscellaneous metal sub will exclude welded wire fabric as a standard practice, and because rebar subcontractors don't read the metal stair specifications, this commonly becomes a scope bust. The general contractor needs to coordinate this work amongst the bidders. Rebar end caps are best allocated to the rebar subcontractor, but they can't always be convinced to provide them. We sometimes run into the predicament that rebar subcontractors cannot provide these end caps because their insurance company prohibits them from taking on this responsibility and this risk. We might be able to get the formwork subcontractor to do it, and the general contractor might do it themselves. But the important thing, of course, is to be sure that they're covered, but not double covered. Let's discuss the coordination between the rebar and masonry subcontractors. We'll start with the dowels at the base of a CMU wall. The cast-in-place dowels at a new concrete slab will be furnished and installed by the rebar subcontractor, and of course they'll use a rebar template provided by the formwork sub as previously discussed. Drilled epoxy dowels will be furnished by the rebar subcontractor, but due to union jurisdictions are actually installed by the formwork subcontractor. Now sometimes we have drilled epoxy dowels because we have an existing building, an existing slab, and existing concrete walls, and those details for the drilling and epoxying will be on the structural drawings. Dowels are commonly damaged. The dowels that are damaged during construction will need to be replaced by the formwork sub, so be sure that anticipated cost is covered. Let's move up the CMU wall and talk about the responsibility for the masonry wall steel. The detailing for the masonry wall steel can actually be completed by either the rebar or masonry subcontractors. The detailing for this rebar is actually very simple, and in many cases isn't even a drawing. In many cases it's just a list of rebar sizes, bends, and lengths. Masonry subs usually don't mind doing this because it's simple, and because it helps them get the rebar in the exact configurations that they prefer. The rebar subcontractor will always furnish the wall steel. The rebar is actually installed by the masonry subcontractor as they progress along constructing their walls block by block. Next we'll move on to some examples of scope busts that are commonly associated with the concrete place and finish trade. Just like the mass excavation trade, the concrete place and finish subcontractor needs to be fully responsible for their own lane closures. In addition to the labor and materials such as cones, arrow boards, and flagmen, this also includes the permits. The concrete place and finish subcontractor needs to draft, submit, procure, and pay for their own permit for the lane closures. This is commonly excluded by the subcontractor, so keep an eye out for it. The place and finish subcontractor needs to be fully responsible for their own light towers for pours that extend after dark. Light towers are commonly necessary for large concrete pours like mat slabs, and they're especially frequent during the winter months when the sun goes down around 5 p.m. Place and finish subs regularly exclude these light towers, but they're not cheap and they've got to be covered. After discharging the concrete, concrete trucks need to be washed out quickly before any of the concrete dries in the drum. So, concrete washout areas need to be placed on site. These concrete washout areas could be covered by the general contractor or the place and finish sub. We just need to make sure that they're covered. Be sure the construction and maintenance of the washout area is addressed in the estimate. Also, demolition and cleanup of the washout area once the major concrete work is done. 
And don't forget disposal of the concrete washout debris. If we don't have enough room for a washout area on site, as is common for projects in dense urban environments like a city center, we can also have the concrete trucks washed out back at the batch plant. Now this is usually more costly than a concrete washout area, but when we don't physically have the room for a washout area on site, we have to go this route. Prior to placing concrete on a form deck, the deck needs to be cleaned. The problem is, with the rebar laid out across the deck, we can't sweep the deck with a broom. So the way we clean off the deck is to blow it off with compressed air. The place and finish subcontractor or general contractor could handle this work, it just needs to be covered. But prior to blowing off the deck, we need to take care of a safety issue, and that safety issue is the potential for airborne metal fragments. The formwork subcontractor is usually good about picking up their nails, but we need to make sure that they pick them all up. Even more important is the rebar subcontractor and their tie wire clippings. Those tie wire clippings get everywhere. The rebar subcontractor may need to go drop a magnet between each and every bar intersection across the deck to pick up all those tie wire clippings. When those tie wire clippings are hit with the compressed air, they go airborne and they are serious safety hazards. The rebar subcontractor needs to be responsible for cleaning up their own tie wire clippings, and that means all of them. Be sure this is addressed in the bid instructions, be sure they don't exclude it in their bid, and make sure this direction finds its way into the subcontract agreement as well. Many of the general duties associated with the place and finish activities are excluded in place and finish bids. These might include scraping concrete truck chutes or disposing of the concrete waste. Do not accept these exclusions. Furthermore, a common problem I've seen in the industry is that general contractor superintendents will usually use two or three of their laborers to help out a concrete place and finish sub during a hectic concrete pour. Now this is not a good practice. The general contractor's laborers should not be directed towards work performed by subcontractors. Regardless of how hectic a concrete pour may be, the general contractor's laborers should not assist the concrete place and finish subcontractor unless it's an emergency. And in that emergency, when the concrete place and finish subcontractor needs assistance from the general contractor's laborers, they need to be back charged for that work. Next we'll discuss coordination between the concrete trades and the elevator subcontractor. When forming the elevator pit walls, we should not penetrate the underslab membrane. There are two different ways of doing this. We could use hung forms. Now these are the least expensive, but they're also the least accurate. Hung forms are when the pit wall forms are tied off to the rebar cage surrounding the pit. Because the rebar itself is rickety, tying the forms off to that rebar makes the forms rickety as well. That's why this is the least accurate method. Quality control is a serious problem with hung forms. The benefit to hung forms is that it allows the slab on grade, pit walls, and pit base all to be completed as one place and finish activity. The more accurate route is to pour the pit base as an early move in. With this method, we can anchor the pit wall forms to the base, and it will provide for much more stable pit wall forms. But with this method, it will be an early move-in for the concrete place and finish subcontractor to pour the base, and probably an additional move-in for the below-grade waterproofing subcontractor as well. This method is highly recommended, but if you're going to use this method, be sure it's addressed in the bid instructions. For hydraulic elevators, the concrete trades will provide a blockout at the base of the elevator pit for the hydraulic ram casing. This blockout is actually infilled by the elevator subcontractor, not the place and finish subcontractor as one might think. So be sure this is addressed in the elevator scope. We'll begin our shotcrete discussion by differentiating between shotcrete and cast in place conditions. Shotcrete cannot be used in all conditions, so we need to be cognizant of the limitations of shotcrete work so we can properly scope the formwork and place and finish subcontractors to fill in the blanks. Shotcrete is commonly used as a means and methods of construction, and as such, it's the general contractor's responsibility to verify where the shotcrete will and will not be used. One thing the general contractor will need to do is verify if the below-grade waterproofing manufacturer will even allow shotcrete. Shotcrete can be detrimental to waterproofing membranes. The shotcrete blast can blow open the membrane seams, and because this damage is done in the act of covering the membrane with a foundation wall, the damage is immediately hidden. Manufacturers know this, and as a result, many manufacturers will not even allow shotcrete to be used against their membrane. If the specified waterproofing manufacturer will not allow shotcrete, we've got to use cast-in-place concrete at the perimeter of the building. Pilasters are commonly so congested with rebar that there isn't sufficient space between the bars to allow for a shotcrete application. In conditions that are heavily congested with rebar, we often need to use cast-in-place concrete in lieu of shotcrete. Large embeds cannot be shotcreted behind, so they typically need to be cast-in-place. 
As you can see in this photo, we can't effectively consolidate the shotcrete behind those large embeds. And consolidation of the concrete behind a large structural embed is absolutely critical. In these conditions, we usually need to block them out and use cast in place concrete. That's why the contractor blocked out the shotcrete around this large embed that you see in this illustration. We must determine if the concrete decks will be placed to or through the shotcrete walls. As you can see in the illustration on the left, this concrete deck was poured through the shotcrete wall. In this condition, there is actually more concrete for the place and finish subcontractor to provide. As you can see in the detail on the right, the concrete deck was poured to the shotcrete wall. In this case, there's more concrete for the shotcrete subcontractor to provide. Notably, this will only be an issue on projects where the concrete deck mix design is equal to the concrete wall mix designs, and they usually are. But if we were to have, let's say, a 4,000 PSI concrete mix for the deck and a 5,000 PSI mix for the wall, we would have to go with the detail on the right. We could not interrupt that 5,000 pound mix for the wall with the 4,000 pound mix in the deck. With different mix designs, we would always use the detail on the right. Unless it's addressed in the bid instructions, the shotcrete subcontractors will always assume the detail on the left, and the place and finish subcontractors will always assume the detail on the right. Okay, let's go through some common scope busts that are associated with the shotcrete trade. A substantial amount of shotcrete bounces off the wall and lands on the ground, commonly as much as 10%. That waste is aptly termed rebound. The shotcrete subcontractor will cover the ground with visqueen to catch the rebound, but that visqueen and all the rebound needs to be hoisted out of the excavation. Now, even for projects with a tower crane, the tower crane is not usually operational at the time that the shotcrete starts at the base of the excavation. So, the shotcrete subcontractor is going to need to get their own crane out there to hoist the rebound out of the excavation. Once that rebound's out of the excavation, we of course need to off-haul and dispose of it. The shotcrete subcontractor should also handle off-hauling and disposing of the rebound. You will commonly find both hoisting and off-hauling and disposing of rebound as exclusions in shotcrete bids. Shotcrete bidders commonly exclude face of wall layout. But that's okay. As long as we include it in the bid instructions, formwork subcontractors don't mind providing the face of wall layout for the shotcrete sub, and then the shotcrete sub takes it from there. Shotcrete subs are not experts at layout, so it's usually best to have the formwork sub do this because they're laying out the rest of the concrete structure anyway, and it keeps layout under the responsibility of a single subcontractor. But again, the formwork subcontractor won't include this unless they're specifically directed to in the bid instructions. And this is a common scope bust. Shotcrete subcontractors need to provide and dispose of their own protection materials, including visqueen over a bentonite waterproofing membrane. That rebound splatters everywhere, including up and to the sides. Bentonite membranes are very popular because they're inexpensive and have good track records. But the bentonite granules are activated by moisture and we can't allow them to activate until the membrane is under compression from the building foundation wall. Rebound is wet, and that moisture will activate the membrane. The installed membrane is going to run at least several feet up and to the side of a day's shotcreting work, so we've got to protect it with visqueen to keep it dry. Shotcrete subs won't do this on their own accord, so we need to identify this protection in the bid instructions. Next we'll talk about scope busts that are associated with the shotcrete scope, but actually impact other trades. Shotcrete nozzlemen need to be certified on each individual project that they work on, and to attain the certification they shoot shotcrete test panels similar to the one that you see in this illustration. In addition to the shotcrete subcontractor, who naturally includes this work as part of their base bid, the test panels need to be constructed by the formwork and rebar subcontractors. Now these are temporary structures, so they're not on the drawings. The formwork and rebar subs will not include these test panels unless specifically directed to in the bid instructions. And don't forget the demolition and off-haul of these test panels. This demo could be completed by the demo sub, the shotcrete sub, the general contractor, or even the site concrete sub laid in the project. The important thing is just to make sure the work is covered, but not double covered. In order to complete the certification process, the third-party special inspector of the project needs to take a core of the test panel back to the laboratory for testing. The reality is that these third-party special inspectors don't do their own concrete coring. They need someone to do it for them. It's usually best for the general contractor to take care of this coring themselves, so just be sure that you have a line item for this coring in your estimate. Key ways of the tops of shotcrete walls are sometimes provided by the shotcrete subs, but more often provided by the formwork subcontractors. The shotcrete subs can scoop out these keyways with a corner of a trowel, or they can stamp them into the tops of the walls, 
But these two methods are not always allowed by structural engineers because structural engineers are concerned with the quality of these methods. So, if the structural engineer requires that the keyways be formed, the formwork subcontractor has got to do it. Now, this requirement for formed keyways might only be found in the shotcrete specification. And note that formwork bidders are not going to review the shotcrete specifications. This is something that needs to be coordinated by the general contractor during the bidding process and described in their bid instructions. Bulkheads for the shotcrete work will be provided by the formwork subcontractor. Now the formwork subcontractor will provide all formwork for the shotcrete work. But of course, pilasters, ends of walls, wall blockouts, and things of that nature will be shown on the contract drawings. The problem is the bulkheads occur at the end of a day's shotcreting work, i.e. the bulkheads occur at the cold joints. Cold joints are not identified on the contract drawings, so these cold joints need to be quantified for the formwork bidders. Similar to the place and finish trade, the shotcrete subcontractors may only mobilize to the project for two or maybe three days at a time. Nevertheless, the shotcrete work is almost always on the project's critical path. So, the schedule requirements for the shotcrete work need to be addressed very clearly and also very fairly in the subcontract agreement. In fairness to the general contractor, a reasonable response time needs to be established. There are comparatively few shotcrete subs out there, and as a result, those guys are in high demand. Shotcrete subs are almost always on the project's critical path, so if they have a delay, the project will be delayed. And repeated shotcrete delays can seriously impact a project. Similarly, we need to establish a reasonable time frame for cleanup of the shotcrete activities. Shotcrete cleanup is usually done the next day, and that's fine, but we can't let that cleanup drag three or four or five days later. The shotcreting activities make a mess, and that mess is in the way of the other trades. So if it's not cleaned up in a timely manner, we're going to have a delay impacts to the other trades in the area. Of course, the subcontract requirements also have to be fair to the shotcrete sub. In fairness to the shotcrete subcontractor, we need to quantify the number of mobilizations to the project. Mobilizations are very expensive for a shotcrete sub. We also need to establish the minimum cancellation notice for a shooting day. If you call a shotcrete sub the night before to cancel, they won't be able to find somewhere else for their crews the next morning. Now, not only will those crews lose a day's pay, but that company is going to lose a day's worth of profit. Just like the subcontractors are responsible for delays to the general contractor, the general contractor needs to be responsible for cost impacts to the subs. This is a very real cost and it does need to be compensated. Establish these cancellation costs during the bidding phase and incorporate those costs into the subcontract agreement. Next we'll discuss the below grade waterproofing sub and we'll start with a few examples of scope busts that are commonly associated with this trade. The necessary prep work over the shoring needs to be covered. The most common problem here are the toenails that are used to tack the timber lagging into place. Those nails are just simply bent over the face of soldier pile. Interestingly, this is only a problem below the water table. Above the water table we'll always have a drainage mat in front of the waterproofing membrane and that drainage mat will protect the membrane from being torn by these nails. But below the water table we don't have a drainage mat, so those nails would tear right through the membrane. The most common solution here is to apply about an 18 inch wide strip of drainage mat over the face of pile and that will protect the membrane from those nails. Now this is just a protection measure and it's a means and methods of construction. So, that drainage mat will not be provided by the waterproofing subcontractor unless it's specifically called for in the bid instructions. A common problem with shotcrete lagging is the finish on the lagging itself. If that finish isn't relatively smooth, it will not be a good substrate for the waterproofing membrane. Another common problem are the gaps between timber lagging boards. If the gaps between timber lagging boards are greater than one inch, it is usually deemed to be an unacceptable substrate for waterproofing membranes. Although we protect the membrane as best we can and teach the workers to take care when working around it, damage to the membrane is pretty much inevitable on any project. The rebar work, general foot traffic, drop tools, and many other things will puncture holes in that membrane. When this damage happens, we rarely know who did it. The best way to handle this is usually to have the waterproofing bidders plan on three or four trips to the site for patching work. Water stop comes in two basic varieties. As you see here, there's the dumbbell type, which is the vertical application. This type is embedded in the concrete, and because it's embedded in the concrete, it's actually provided by the formwork sub. Water stop also comes in a peel and stick variety, and that's what you see in red in this illustration. That type of water stop is actually provided by the waterproofing subcontractor. Not only do we need to determine which type of water stop we have, 
but we need to determine the quantity of the water stop. Water stop will be provided at all cold joints, and cold joints are not shown on the contract drawings, so this needs to be established in the bid instructions. As mentioned in the shoring segment, the waterproofing subcontractor also needs to know the quantity of tieback boots that they're going to need to provide. Knowing the quantity of tieback heads is one thing, but the waterproofing bidders also need to know whether or not the tiebacks are going to be detentioned. The distinction here is that if the tieback heads are not detentioned, the waterproofing subcontractor will be able to apply these boots over the tieback heads right in conjunction with the rest of the membrane installation. But if the tieback heads are detentioned, the waterproofing subcontractor is going to have to plan for an additional mobilization for the comeback work to patch these tieback heads after the detentioning has occurred. The delineation of work between the waterproofing and MEP subcontractors for penetrations through the below grade membrane needs to be addressed in the bid instructions. This rough illustration shows a steel sleeve through a concrete foundation wall with a copper pipe running through the middle of the sleeve. The steel sleeves are traditionally furnished and installed by the plumbing subcontractor and that pipe sleeve serves as a delineation of work between these two subcontractors. The exterior side of the basement wall has a waterproofing membrane with a drainage mat and the below grade waterproofing subcontractor should be held responsible for sealing their membrane to the outside of the steel pipe sleeve. However, the plumbing sub should be responsible for sealing between their pipe and the inside of the steel pipe sleeve. They do this with an off-the-shelf product called a link seal. In conditions where the top of the waterproofing membrane will be exposed, such as this illustration which shows a waterproofing membrane running up the face of a concrete wall, we'll always need flashing to cover the top of the membrane. Now the waterproofing subcontractor will always provide a termination bar, which is just an anchor bar for the top of the membrane, but someone needs to pick up that flashing also. Now the flashing subcontractor could provide this, or the waterproofing subcontractor. The important thing, as always, is to be sure the flashing is covered, but not double covered. Formwork and rebar supports can create a tremendous number of waterproofing penetrations. The easiest way to support the wall steel and the wall forms is to anchor the supports through the waterproofing membrane to the lagging boards. The problem is, this turns the membrane into Swiss cheese. Not only is this a very costly patching effort for the waterproofing subcontractor, but it's naturally a very poor waterproofing system once you're done. The rebar subcontractor might plan to anchor through that membrane at four feet on center, both vertically and horizontally, and the formwork subcontractor might penetrate the membrane just as many times with their form ties. Adding insult to injury, these temporary supports penetrating the membrane are not going to be shown on the contract drawings. Therefore, the waterproofing bidders are not going to include them in their base bid unless specifically directed to include this patching in the bid instructions. As an alternative to these penetrations, we have the option of internally bracing the forms and rebar. This eliminates those penetrations, but it does amount to more work for the formwork and rebar subcontractors. Now, this illustration clearly describes how to internally brace the formwork, and that's pretty straightforward. But some of you may be wondering, how do you internally brace the rebar? Because those internal braces would seem to be in the way of the formwork installation. Well, the way this works is that the formwork subcontractor will actually provide the internal bracing for the rebar sub, and that will just be two buys that are used to prop up the rebar in place. As the formwork sub goes along constructing their wall forms, they remove the temporary rebar bracing, put their wall forms in front of the rebar, tie off the rebar to the wall forms, and keep proceeding along in that route. Now, that might sound a little bit hokey, but it's not. The reality is that that works quite well, and most formwork subcontractors are familiar with this method. Alright, now we'll move into the site work trades, and we'll start this segment with the AC paving sub. The AC paving work is commonly phased to provide unrestricted access for the other trades, but this presents a remobilization cost for the AC paving sub. Remobilization for the AC paving sub is very expensive. It is not cheap to truck all that heavy equipment to the project site. But on the other hand, the AC paving work can occupy the entire perimeter of a site if we're not careful. That work can force the other subcontractors to demobilize or relocate their trailers and cargo boxes, and because the AC paving work is done at the end of a project, we're forcing those other subs to relocate and demobilize at the same time that we're pushing those subs in the rush to project completion. We need to get the AC paving work done with as little impact to the other trades as possible, but that comes at the price of remobilization. This needs to be conveyed to the AC paving subs in the bid instructions, or, even more commonly, this phasing is relayed to the subcontractors via the project schedule that's issued as part of the bidding documents. That schedule will show the AC paving subcontractor mobilizing to do their work in multiple phases. 
To provide for a clean working surface throughout the duration of construction, while still providing an excellent finished product at the end, the AC paving work may be installed in multiple lifts. The way this works is the grading, aggregate base, and first AC paving list will be completed at the onset of a project, but the final paving lift is not completed until the project nears completion. Clean working surfaces are paramount to efficient construction, so holding down the paving a couple inches to provide for a clean lot for construction purposes, and then doing the final couple inches at the end of a project so the owner still gets a new lot is a great idea. Naturally, this is a cost impact for the AC paving subcontractor, but we commonly save so much more in efficiency that it's actually a cost savings. Of course, the AC paving subcontractor is not going to plan for this phasing unless it's described in the bid instructions or, as previously mentioned, the project schedule that's issued as part of the bidding documents. The pavement striping work is usually handled by the AC paving subcontractors, but interestingly, they don't usually self-perform that work. They subcontract that work to a separate striping subcontractor. So, for a project with a large surface parking lot, the AC paving subcontractor will provide the striping. But, for a parking garage, where the striping is interior, painted on concrete, not AC paving, the general contractor will actually hire that striping sub directly. Parking signage is allocated similarly to the striping work. The AC paving sub will routinely pick up the exterior parking signage, but not the interior signage such as we would find in a parking garage. Now, the AC paving sub will only pick up the code required parking signage, such as handicap signs, stop signs, slow signs, etc. They will not pick up the site convenience signage, such as a directional sign pointing pedestrians towards the lobby, or directional signage showing the truckers the route to the loading dock. The interior parking signage and site convenience signs will need to be provided by the signage subcontractor. Milling and patching the streets outside the site due to construction damage is often necessary, but it's not going to be shown on the drawings. This is especially common for inner city projects. Trucking operations, cranes, and concrete pumps are just a few things that tear up those city streets. Now the drawings are not going to show repairs for construction damage, but the city is going to require that the contractor bring the streets back up to the condition that they were in prior to the start of construction. And because this work won't be shown on the construction drawings, it won't be picked up by the AC paving bidders unless it's specifically included in the bid instructions. Alright, next we'll run through some examples associated with the landscaping and irrigation scopes of work. There will always be a backflow preventer between the water supply and the irrigation system. That backflow preventer is a very common scope bust. The irrigation subcontractor should typically pick up their work at the downstream end of the backflow preventer and carry their work out from that point. The backflow preventer itself should be provided by the plumbing subcontractor if it's within 5 feet of the building footprint and by the site utility subcontractor if it's more than 5 feet away from the building. This is due to union jurisdictional rules. The irrigation subcontractor is not typically the best person to pick up the backflow preventer, but the plumbing and site utility subcontractors routinely exclude this work so be sure to keep an eye out for it in their bids. Be sure the maintenance period qualified in the landscaping bids matches the duration specified by the contract documents. For instance, the contract documents will always call for the maintenance period to begin at substantial completion, but the landscaping bids may qualify that the maintenance period actually begins at completion of their work. But completion of their work may be several months before substantial completion. So what the landscaping subcontractor needs to do is provide maintenance from completion of their work to substantial completion and then for three months beyond substantial completion. The landscaping bidders may also qualify a shorter duration for the maintenance period. For instance, the specifications might call for three months and they may qualify 30 days. That's very common. Keep an eye out for these things when you're analyzing the landscaping bids. When we think of landscaping subcontractors, we usually think of the guys who are bringing the plants and the dirt into the project. Interestingly, this sub actually picks up the trash cans, ash urns, manufactured benches, tree grates, and other site furnishings for the project also. Due to union jurisdictions, irrigation lines running within the interior of a building are typically provided by the plumbing subcontractor, not the irrigation sub. Also, due to building codes, the irrigation lines running through the interior of a building are typically done with copper pipe, not PVC. For this example, let's look at a plaza deck. The waterproofing envelope surrounding the building is typically where we delineate the work between the plumbing and irrigation subcontractors. This typically satisfies both the union jurisdictional issues and the code issues. 
So, if the irrigation line is running on top of the waterproofing membrane as shown in this illustration, the landscaping subcontractor will provide it. And of course, all piping through the building, up to and including the penetration through the membrane, will be provided by the plumbing subcontractor. On a related note, irrigation control wires running through the building are not usually run loose. They're usually required to be in conduit. That conduit through the building is provided by the electrical subcontractor. Next, we'll discuss site utilities. We'll begin by discussing the responsibilities for the various site utilities on a project, because these responsibilities are really not very intuitive. The natural gas service for the building will be provided as a joint effort of the site utility subcontractor and the utility provider. First, the site utility subcontractor will always have all work downstream of the meter, between the meter and the building. The utility provider will provide much, if not all, of the work between the city main and the meter, up to and including the meter itself. Different cities have different requirements here. In some cases, the utility provider may require that the site utility subcontractor perform all trenching, backfill, and compaction between the city main and the meter. In other cases, the utility provider will do that themselves. In all cases, the utility provider will provide all piping, including the meter and the tie-in to the city main themselves. They do this because of the crucial safety concerns associated with this work. The domestic and fire water services will be provided as a joint effort of the site utility subcontractor and the utility provider. In this case, the site utility subcontractor usually provides all work with two exceptions. First, the meter is usually furnished by the utility provider and installed by the site utility subcontractor. These meters are usually provided for free, but sometimes there is a fee associated with them. Secondly, the actual tie-in into the city main is usually done by the utility provider. But once again, we need to verify what the utility provider is going to provide themselves and scope the site utility subcontractor to provide everything else. Pressurized utilities like natural gas and domestic water are much more sensitive to damage. This is why much more care needs to be taken when working with them and why the utility providers are always much more involved with their installation. Gravity systems like storm drains and sanitary sewers are not nearly as sensitive. So, the storm drain and sanitary sewer work will be completed entirely by the site utility subcontractor, including the final tie-in to the city mains. The electrical service will be provided as a joint effort between the electrical subcontractor and the utility provider. The site utility subcontractor is not involved with the electrical service. For the electrical service, we need to verify who will provide the vault, who will provide the transformer, who will provide the trenching and backfill, who will provide the conduit, and who will provide and pull the cabling. Now in this case, we actually have two runs of cable. We have a run of conduit and cable from the city main vault to the project specific vault, and we have another run of conduit and cable from the project vault to the building. Who provides the trenching and backfill, conduit, and cables at each of these two different runs might be different on individual projects. For instance, the utility provider might provide and pull the cabling from their vault to the building transformer, and the electrical subcontractor might provide and pull the cabling from the building transformer to the building. On this same project, the electrical subcontractor may actually have to provide the conduit for the utility company from their vault to the project vault. This can get very convoluted, so be very, very cautious when reviewing exactly what utility providers will provide with regard to the electrical service and what they won't. For the telephone and cable TV, the electrical subcontractor will do everything except pull and terminate the cabling. The electrical subcontractor will provide the trenching, backfill, conduit, pull boxes, and vaults. And the utility provider will provide the cabling and pull the cabling all the way into the building and terminate on one side of a patch panel within the building. The electrical subcontractor will then begin their work on the building side of the patch panel. As you can see, it's very important to understand the specific divisions of work for the city your project happens to be in. Utility providers will dictate what work they're going to perform, and we simply just have to do whatever's left. Now that we've covered coordination with utility companies, let's talk about coordination between the site utility subcontractor and the other trades. It's always best to perform the site utilities work at the beginning of a project as opposed to the end. At the end of the project, the critical path should be tearing down the scaffolding and following right behind the scaffolding with the sidewalks and landscaping. You don't want to have to worry about site utilities at the end of the project. Also at the end of the project, the site is covered with trailers, cargo boxes, materials, etc. There's much more clear space at the front end of a project than there is at the end. 
Earlier in this course, we discussed the myriad of trades for which the excavation subcontractor offhauls the spoils. But the site utility subcontractor is not one of those trades for which the excavation sub offhauls the spoils. The site utility subcontractor should offhaul their own spoils. The site utility subcontractor needs to maintain full responsibility for their own lane closures. In addition to the cones, arrow boards, flagmen, etc., this also needs to include drafting of the plan, submitting the plan to public works, and pulling the permit. The site utility subcontractor will provide their own insulating material such as dry therm, but they will not provide their own formwork. The formwork for dry therm materials could be either wood or gypsum board, and that depends primarily on the stage of the project for which this underground work is performed. Dry therm is a material that's commonly used to insulate underground steam piping, and the material is very expensive. So instead of dumping the material into the neat cut trenches, we always form the sides to conserve materials. If these utilities are put in at the front end of a project, we'll usually allocate the work to the formwork subcontractor, and their material of choice for the forming will be wood forms. If these utilities are scheduled to go in at the end of a project, the formwork subcontractor won't be on site anymore. So late in a project, it's usually best for the framing subcontractor to provide these forms. And the framing subcontractor will usually provide the forms with metal studs and gypsum board, as opposed to wood, just quite simply because those are the materials their workers are most familiar with. Although the piping and the dry therm will be shown in the contract documents, the formwork will not. So neither the formwork or framing bidders will pick this work up unless they're specifically directed to in the bid instructions. And the final subcontractor we'll discuss in part one of this course is the site concrete trade. Notably, the delineation of work between the site concrete work and the structural concrete trades is usually made at the building perimeter. Any concrete work within the building itself is completed by the formwork, rebar, place and finish, and chalkcrete trades. Any work outside the building footprint will be picked up by the site concrete trade. The responsibility for concrete footings at site work elements is not very intuitive. Site work footings are actually provided by a variety of subcontractors. Steel pipe bollards are furnished by the miscellaneous metal subcontractor, but they're actually installed, including the concrete footing, by the site concrete subcontractor. Footings for the code required parking signage will be provided by the AC paving subcontractor, and of course footings for the site convenience signage will be provided by the signage subcontractor. The chain link fencing subcontractor will provide their own footings for the fence posts. Light pole manufacturers actually design concrete footings to go along with their light poles. These standard manufactured design footings will be provided by the electrical subcontractor, but if the light pole is mounted to any foundation other than this standard footing, the site concrete subcontractor will provide it. For instance, if we have a light pole on top of a retaining wall or on top of a concrete seat wall, the site concrete subcontractor will provide the footing and of course set the anchor bolts as well. Concrete pads for the gas meter, transformer, irrigation controller, and other utilities will be provided by the site concrete subcontractor, but these pads aren't always easy to find on the drawings, and sometimes they can't be found at all on the drawings. The irrigation controller pad might only be found on an obscure landscape detail. The transformer pad may only be referenced from a sheet note on the electrical site plan. And the gas meter pad, if found at all, might only be on an obscure plumbing detail. Be sure to address these pads with your bid instructions. Well, that wraps up part one of this course. I hope you all enjoyed it, and we'll continue your learning with parts two and three. Thank you.